We can only ask questions uh, in the exam that deal with these topics because other topics are important as well. It's just the headline stuff and this doesn't preclude any other topics that we want to talk about. Okay, so uh, let's first talk about the idea of investing in emerging markets in theory. So, uh, as you know, and the Butler book talked about it at length, there is something called portfolio theory. And portfolio theory is very often explained with two stocks or a stock in a bond or uh, things like that. But you can also extend it internationally and talk about stocks in different countries or talk about uh, country indices in different countries. And basically the same logic holds. And the logic is that the return of the portfolio is just the weighted average return. Yeah? In the formula that you see here in the slide, X1 is the weight of the first asset of the first country, and X2 is the weight of the second country or the second asset, and the R1 and R2 are the returns. So this is just the weighted average return. So that's how, how you calculate the portfolio return. That's also how you should have done it or hopefully did in the large assignment uh, that we did in the course. And the variance is not just the weighted average return, because in the variance, there's also the interplay between the assets, and that interplay is measured by the correlation. And um, that correlation is important because a correlation of lower than one, that will reduce the standard deviation or the variance of the portfolio. So uh, you already have diversification effects if, if the correlation is lower than one, and the lower it gets, the closer it gets to minus one, the more useful that diversification is. So the key to portfolio thinking is that you have this uh, interaction between assets that can again be two assets, three assets, can be two countries, can be different types of assets, stocks and bonds, real estate and stocks, etc., etc. And the lower the correlation is, the more useful is diversification. Now, to put that into a graph, uh, the, 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 the Markowitz is the, the inventor of portfolio theory. He even got a Nobel Prize for it. He saw that um, all the, the best portfolios, you could say, uh, if you would map out the best portfolios on a, on a, on a surface that have on the uh, x-axis, the horizontal axis, the risk, and on the y-axis, so the vertical axis, the return. So that's a space or a surface that describes the risk and return of any portfolio. Now, where you want to be on that portfolio is as uh, you want to be as low as possible in terms of risk, and you want to be as high as possible in terms of return. So that means you want to go into the northwest of this graph. That's the best place to be on this surface. And what he showed is that the best portfolios lie on a line, and that line he called the efficient frontier. Now, you could map out an efficient frontier for assets within a country, and that would be the efficient frontier that goes through point A. And then if you would add uh, uh, countries to this, to, this, um, to this mix, meaning that you can have a diversification effect, and how big that is we're going to talk about in a minute, but you also have the effect of adding more assets, including assets that are maybe lower risk than what you can find in your own country, but also assets that have a higher risk in return that you can find in your own country. And that would mean that the efficient frontier shifts to the left and or shifts to the west or the northwest even, and that's exactly where you want to be. It means that for a given risk, you can either increase your return or for a, for a given return, you can decrease your risk, and that is both superior than uh, what you could find in the domestic uh, portfolios alone. So the best international portfolios are superior to the best domestic portfolios, and that is the main benefit of international investment, in theory. Uh, another way to look at it is by just looking at the risk reduction effect. And we have seen that uh, the, the, the import, hey, risk has two parts. Risk is measured in standard deviation, and, um, and you, can, you can disentangle that standard deviation in two components. The first component is the market risk, the systematic risk is the other word for it, and the other component is the unsystematic risk or specific risk. And 
Um, what you see here is, is two fat lines and two horizontal lines. And the upper horizontal line denotes the domestic market risk. And that means that if you diversify your portfolio and you add assets, hey, you add the number of assets to the portfolio, then the risk of the portfolio will gradually go down in asymptotic fashion until it can no longer go down and then you're at the domestic market risk. And then so, uh, so the risk that you have diversified away then, that was the specific risk for any, for any one asset and you're left with the market risk. But if you're going to diversify internationally, then you will find that the global market risk is actually lower than the domestic market risk. Again, because you have more investment opportunities and therefore more diversification opportunities. Basically what you do, you add more difference to your portfolio. If you add more difference, then you add lower uh, correlations, more diversification, and you can lower your risk. So the global market risk is lower than the domestic market risk, which is another very important rationale for, uh, for international investment. So, um, the point, so this is the nice part of it. Yeah, so, so by adding countries, you reduce uh, stock market risk. But that means that you also add a new component of risk to your investment, and that's currency risk. Now, of course, even if you would be, let's say, French, and you would just in invest in French companies, you run an indirect currency risk. Yeah, so if you would invest in the stocks of Elf Aquitaine, uh, Elf Aquitaine uh, sells its uh, products abroad and Elf Aquitaine buys its oil on the international oil market and that means that they uh, need dollars to buy the oil so if the dollar goes up in, in, in value relative to the euro that's bad for Elf Aquitaine because then they need to uh, pay more for the oil that they need and that they want to sell in France so even, even Elf Aquitaine, the stocks of Elf Aquitaine, if you buy them as a euro investor, run an indirect currency risk. But if you go international, that currency risk becomes more salient. It becomes it co becomes direct because then, eh, if I buy, for example, the shares of Exxon Mobil in the United States, and uh, and the dollar goes up, then I actually like it because that means that uh, my shares go up in value because these shares are denoted in US dollars. Now, this is much less relevant for a stock investor than for a bond investor because um, we're talking here still about risk issues and uh, the bond, the, 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 sorry, the, um, the, the variance or the volatility of, the, uh, of a stock is way higher than the volatility of the currency risk, so, uh, of the currency. So you could, see, you could say that the currency risk relative to the stock market risk not negligible, but it is rather small. On the other hand, if you're investing in bonds, that means you're, you have a sort of lower risk attitude probably. There, uh, the currency risk is very high relative to the bond risk. So it really adds risk to your portfolio. So, so it means that diversification or, or hedging becomes more relevant. Now, another thing is that if stock investors could diversify perfectly, then currency hedging within the corporation would become ir irrelevant because you can diversify currency risk away. And currency risk is not price, so it, be it, be it would become irrelevant. But we'll come back to that. It's basically the portfolio uh, uh, thinking about currency risk. We'll come back to the technical issues in currency risk later in the talk. Now, there's also this. So this is the theory of investing in emerging stock markets. There's also the practice of it. And the practice of it is that um, despite home bias, investors from the West have, emerged, have, have, have increasingly been investing in emerging markets and they do so structurally. And the way they do it is they use global stock market indices like the MSCI index that we've seen to determine their allocation. So basically their country allocation and to extend also their allocation to emerging markets in general is driven by the weights of these indices. So these indices are very, very important uh, to determine investment strategies in emerging markets. And you should really know a lot about it. Um, emerging stock markets have to become too big to ignore. Okay? So we've talked about the capital asset pricing model. And the, the, the one important lesson from the capital asset pricing model is that the most 
efficiently diversified portfolio is the market portfolio. And that means that if something is part of the market portfolio, you should either invest in it or explain with very good arguments why you're not investing in any merchant stock markets are very much part of the global market index. But they're still still underrepresented in institutional portfolios in the West, in Europe, in the United States, in Canada. And that is because they have a lower free float. So not all of the shares of the companies uh, that exist, that even of the listed companies, are floated on the stock exchange. They have weaker stock market institutions, a sort of ownership and investor protection and other issues. And there is something called home bias and, 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 and um, that's, that, that's, that's there uh, in most countries. So investors prefer investing in their own home country rather than in countries far away. And interestingly, in countries where diversification would make most sense, which, in, which is in emerging markets, and there, there in terms of risk spreading, it would make a lot of sense to, uh, to invest internationally far more pro probably than, uh, let's say, a U.S. investor, but there the home bias is actually biggest. Now, diversification can be measured by the correlation, and I've shown you that uh, the, the, the correlations between emerging stock markets and developed markets have, have, are now around 8.8, 8.9. That means that diversification is not so important anymore to invest internationally. It's still an issue. But it's not as important as an argument as it was like 10, 20 years ago. They, another important motivation that is still important is that emerging stock markets have a higher average return, higher average potential due to their higher growth, but they also have a higher risk, so you should be aware of that. And lastly, if you look at the risk of emerging markets, standard deviation, which is the commonly used yardstick for investment risk, may not adequately capture the, uh, the overall risk of emerging stock market investments because there are also, let's say, underlying risks that the standard deviation doesn't really measure, like the risk of appropriation, of nationalization, lower property rights, more corruption, less transparency, etc., etc. And that is not picked up by the standard deviation, but it's a very big risk source for investors, so you should be aware of that. Now, then you can also, of course, invest in emerging market debt. And on, at first sight, that looks really good because if you look at, uh, I said, one big factor driving the uh, risk of, um, uh, of, uh, of investments, of, of bond investments, government bond investments, is the debt to GDP ratio. Because the debt to GDP ratio gives you an idea of the extent to which governments are going to be able to pay back their loan. Yeah, because governments, if, if, if in a country there is a certain GDP, governments are able to tax uh, on that GDP, and this tax basis determines the, the amount they can uh, put in their debt, yeah, to, to pay interest and amortization of their debt. So a very high debt to GDP ratios means that debt service is going to be problematic and it's harder to pay back loans and pay the interest rates. And a low debt to GDP ratio is the reverse. Now, emerging markets have, um, uh, have generally low debt to GDP ratio. So at first sight, that will be really good, especially combined with the fact, with the fact that, they, uh, that in terms of um, the, um, the spread, uh, the, the, the interest rate, um, uh, uh, on emerging market debt is higher than the interest rate on developed market debt. So it's an attractive investment for, uh, for investors. But in times of crisis, this spread sometimes goes away or it even turns negative uh, uh, because then investors lose their, their confidence and they sell emerging market debt so that the, uh, the prices of the uh, debt go down, which means that the, uh, uh, the effective interest rate goes up. And uh, that means that emerging market debt is riskier, even though the lower debt to GDP ratios is there, because they uh, because emerging markets tend to default more than um, uh, than developed market debt. And this debt intolerance is due to the relatively low cost of default for emerging market governments, because if you default, the financial markets punish you 
by next time demanding a far higher interest rate. And um, a country like uh, a country like Argentina, for example, has defaulted so often that it has to pay a high interest rate anyway. A country like Germany, on the other hand, pays a very low interest rate, even a negative interest rate. They get money if you buy their bonds, uh, because 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 investors know that whatever happens, they get their money back, and it's a safe investment. If Germany would default, then all of a sudden investors lose that confidence, lose that trust, and then uh, Germany sh would have to pay a huge, a huge premium uh, in order to get uh, to still get to get capital from uh, bond investors. So it would be very, very expensive for Germany to default. Whereas for Argentina, it's not that expensive. So. Um, um, and lastly, very important is that uh, uh, whereas in the past the um, let's say debt debt investments in emerging markets would be through uh, government debt, in the last decade or so we see that corporations in emerging markets also increasingly raise their foreign capital through bond issuance, rely less on bank finance, and that means that this is another way to invest in emerging market debt, which could be a very interesting way because in many ways. Uh, corporations in emerging markets are lower risk than the governments uh, of the countries in which they operate. Now, so this is the investment part uh, where we talk about investments from a Western point of view into emerging markets. But there's also, of course, finance issues going on within the emerging markets themselves, which may be more relevant to the citizens of these emerging markets. And, um, and, 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 and that, that whole topic is described with the term financial inclusion or exclusion. Um, for financial inclusion means, um, uh, describes people that are included in the financial system. That means that they can make, for example, payments through a bank, that they can get credit, that they can save their money, that they can invest, they can uh, borrow uh, uh, to get a mortgage of their home, etc., etc. So, so uh, if you do not have access to finance, life can be very difficult. And I think it's a good way, a good thing for you to think about that a bit, to think about how life would be if you could not make long rate range payments, or if your parents could not do that for you, paying, for example, the rent of your apartment in, in Maastricht. Uh, uh, if you could not store your money safely, if you could not save, if you could not borrow for a mortgage, etc., etc., that would make life very difficult and time-consuming and, and unsafe, and it would also be very difficult for you to get out of poverty if you would not have access to finance. So in, in that sense, it's like having access to clean water. It's really a life necessity, although maybe people don't think about it that way. But it really is. Think about your own life. Think about how your own life would be if you would not have access to finance. It would be tough. Now, there are three economic obstacles to financial inclusion, especially when it concerns credit. And these are moral hazard, adverse selection, and asymmetric information. I'm not going to explain them. You, you know what they're about. They're in the literature. But you need to know more about that. Um, there are also operational obstacles to financial inclusion in emerging markets, and these are mostly scale and poor infrastructure. So, so the loans that are given out to uh, very poor people, very often small, eh, in microcredit we're talking about a couple of hundred dollars or euros per loan, uh, but the cost you have to make in order to give out the loan, eh, to monitor people when they already have a loan, to make sure that they pay it back, these costs are to a large extent given are fixed costs and they would be more or less the same for a large loan or a smaller loan and it means that as a percentage of the outstanding loan uh, the costs are very high and that means that the interest rates are very very high and that makes it not so attractive to borrow maybe for poor people so scale is a really issue a big issue another issue is poor infrastructure uh, if you need a branch a bank branch network uh, in, uh, for example, a country like Zimbabwe, it's a really, really, really big country uh, with a population not very densely. Uh, yeah, so, of course, there are some, some, some cities where the population density is high, outside of it is very low, and then it's not so attractive to set up a banking branch network 
And again, that makes access for people to banks and to that sort of financial services really difficult. Now, what you need to know is that these problems also existed in developing developed economies 100 years ago, because the, the current developed economies, you could say, are the emerging markets of that period. And these problems have largely been solved, for example, by initiatives of uh, farmers, uh, um, uh, uh, farmers uh, banks, or post banks, or, or, or other initiatives. And these 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 initiatives, they um, and they did something about the scale. They did something about the moral hazard at first selection. And you really need to think about that, how that worked, and how these solutions uh, address the issues and the problems that we discussed uh, above. And I think the, 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 the great hope for uh, financial inclusion currently is mobile money. And mobile money technology helps a lot with overcoming moral hazard and adverse selection, especially in asymmetric information, because through people's, um, let's say, behavior on their phone and the way they pay their bills on the phone, there's a, the, 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 the company knows a lot, the phone company knows a lot about, about the financial behavior of their customers. And that means that that reduces the asymmetric information. It overcomes the infrastructure issue because you don't need a bank branch network anymore. And, uh, and, and it's so cheap and efficient that even small scale payment or small scale lending becomes uh, financially uh, feasible. So I think mobile money technology will really lead to increasing financial inclusion in emerging markets already happening. For example, in China, you've got Ant Financial, which is doing it. In uh, Kenya, you've got uh, M-Pesa. There are, of course, issues there also in terms of monopoly pricing, in terms of privacy. But this really has the power to transform um, uh, people's lives because they, because they become more financially included. Now, uh, financial inclusion is also a key ingredient for economic development, as we've seen in a couple of papers. Um, so we know that poor access to finance is really a constraint for businesses, as the World Bank showed in emerging markets. More important than corruption, more important than crime, and more important than poor infrastructure. So access to finance is really a major impediment to grow. Um, we also have seen a paper in Science that's part of the literature pack that shows that financial innovations at the micro level, so really at the, at the family level, uh, and better finance related growth uh, institutions also support growth, especially uh, mobile money. Remittances do not really seem to, uh, to do that. And, um, but access to foreign capital can also do it, but, um, but not always. Eh? So foreign direct investment, yes, it seems to be mostly beneficial, but it also depends on the local institutions. Liberalized capital markets, yes, they do support growth, but especially for countries that already do well on other issues like secondary education. Edu education. A foreign bank entry, in fact, does not support economic development because it, uh, it, it pushes out local banks and the local banks are more inclined to lend to, uh, uh, to, to, lend to startups and small firms, which, are in, which, is, which is the lifeblood of businesses also in uh, emerging markets. Uh, so that's not so good actually for, uh, for development and, and growth. Okay, back to currency risk, uh, very important part of this course. Um, you, so to understand currency risk better, uh, we have uh, Butler, the Butler book gives a classification of it. So first we have to um, distinguish risk from exposure. Risk is the volatility of the asset you own. It could be a currency, it could be a, 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 an amount of dollars. It could be, uh, or, or it could be a stock investment. It could be any asset. That's risk. Um, and exposure is how much money you have at risk. So, uh, so if you're, uh, if you have a hundred thousand dollars coming in, then you have a certain exposure. If you have a million dollars coming in, you have more exposure. Yeah, so, uh, so that's the word exposure. It's basically, how much money do you have? have do you, do do you have you put on the line? and is at risk. Now, you can then distinguish that exposure when it comes to currency uh, uh, issues in basically two ways. There's economic exposure, 
that is the exposure of your cash flows, of the cash flows you have at risk. Um, uh, so you are, you are a firm, you have cash flows coming in, and the economic exposure is basically all these cash flows that are at risk and that are under the risk of some uh, fluctuation of some currency. And that you can distinguish again into transaction exposure, that is monetary cash flows or contractual cash flows, for example, from uh, delivery of goods that you have uh, or, or bonds or, or things like that. So it's really, since it's contractual, it's very hard to predict, to measure, and therefore also to hedge, to, do, uh, to, to, to hedge the risk. But there's also operating exposure. That's, that describes all other cash flows and change in market value. So uh, that is proceeds from sales above or below contract. That is changes in the, in the value of an asset. That is dividends that you get from a foreign uh, uh, investment. It's not easy to measure and not easy to predict and therefore not very easy to hedge. And hedging will therefore be always a bit imprecise. Then there's also translation exposure. Uh, that is maybe less important from a finance point of view, not so from an accounting point of view, because uh, if you own, let's say, a factory in the United States uh, and you're a, uh, you're a Brazilian investor and the US dollar goes down relative to your currency, that means that that factory is now all of a sudden worth less. You have to adjust your financial accounting statement due to that currency movement alone. There's no cash flow effect because you're not selling the factory or something. It's, it's still there, it's still producing, but it has become worthless. For shareholders, that's completely irrelevant because they just care about cash flows. But for managers, it is because very often managers' compensation system and career is based on the financial accounting uh, information. And if uh, things go bad in terms of the accounts, then they may also go bad for the managers. So managers are uh, more interested very often in translation exposure than the investors in companies. Now, so that is the measurement and classification of currency. And um, so you could do something about it. You can hedge currency risk. And the aim is to reduce risk. And that's very important. In the assignment that we did, I saw that people discussed hedging issues in terms of return. It's nice if you get a bigger return if you do hedging, but that's not the purpose. The purpose is to reduce risk. So hedging in that sense is just like insurance. Yeah? So if you take out fire insurance, you don't do that to make your house worth more. You do it so that uh, if it burns down, you get your money back. So it's a risk reduction uh, thing. Insurance is and hedging is too. And it seems easy, but it's actually harder than it seems. So, it, again, think about it, it's, it's there to reduce your risk. And contractual cash flows are easy to predict. But operational cash flows, profits, dividends, stock price returns are very difficult to predict. And that means there's a big risk of overhedging and that you, you, you hedge too much. So let's say you're a euro investor and you expect an, a, 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 a number of dollars as dividend payment but the company you've invested in wasn't so fantastic and it turns out that the dividend is lower than you expected. So you hedge too much. And if you hedge too much, you actually increase your risk because then you, 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 you err on the wrong side, again, increasing your risk and your exposure to, uh, to, to, to that currency. Plus you made all the costs to hedge, so it was too much, too expensive too. That's one issue to think about. Second issue to think about, is that there's this conflict of interest between um, company, ma company management and the investor and between the top management and the business unit. So hedging may seem good for a manager out of different reasons, like compensation, uh, uh, stable uh, uh, accounting profit, etc., etc. But for the, for the overall firm and the shareholders, they have the diversified exposure. So for them, hedging does not always add economic value and can actually increase risk. Yes, you, so, so probably they don't want hedging to go on inside the firm. Um, now, there's different ways to manage transaction exposure. Uh, you can do it internally or externally. So internally is cheap, cheaper than externally. It's sometimes also 
better. It's, it's better to do. So the two main approaches to do it, internet, do it internally are multinational netting, uh, netting and leading and lagging of cash flows. So if you do multinational netting, let, that's netting let's say you're a, you're a, you're a, a multinational with uh, 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 branches in, uh, uh, so you're based, let's say, in, uh, in France, and you have uh, uh, an affiliation in Brazil, and one in, um, uh, let's say, Kenya, and one uh, in uh, Poland, let's say. And uh, so first what you do is you map the amounts of all the within firm transactions between countries for a given time period. So what, 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 is the, what amounts do you expect for the next half year, the next two months, or the next three months, or, or between a half year and a year out? What kind of, what kind of amounts will that firm see within, between countries uh, on a bilateral way? Uh, hey, in terms of the in terms of all the currencies that are relevant for that for that firm, so that's the first thing you do. You basically map uh, the amounts and the and the and the movements of currency. Then you translate all these amounts in your home currency. So for a U.S. firm it would be dollars, for a euro-based firm it would be euros, etc., etc. And then you uh, what you're then going to do is uh, so there, for example, uh, if I'm a company that operates in in Europe, and I, uh, I I also have an affiliate affiliate in uh, in, Can in Canada. There there's money going to Canada, and there's money going from Canada to me. And so uh, so then what you do is you're going to net out these uh, these amounts between country pairs, so that you just are left with the net amounts. And then what you do is you optimize and minimize all the transfers. And then what you do is the remaining exposure you hedge. Now, this is very well explained in the book, and it's very relevant as a tool. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, so this is important to know. Now, then there's also leading and lagging of cash flows. So what you do is you lead the inflow. So the cash inflows you try to get earlier, and you try to lag the, the outflows. That is better for you from a, a, a time value of money perspective. And that way you can do your netting. But you have to understand that leading incurs costs. Yeah, you can you can renegotiate, but your uh, uh, but your client your client has to pay earlier, and he will want or he or she will want a compensation for that. You can borrow money uh, already in advance of the customer uh, paying, but that also costs money. Or you can use factoring, where where a bank pays you for the money that will come in and then the bank collects that money, but that costs money too. And so uh, the, uh, the, what you're going to do in terms of leading and lagging, that depends really on these costs. The other way is to manage currency exposure in the financial markets, doing, using it, doing it externally. And for that, there are hedging instruments available in the market. And the Butler book talks about uh, a couple, and we have uh, focused on three of them, forward, futures, and options. So first, forwards and futures. Um, the main, the main, main, let's say, um, the thing they have in common is that they serve the same purpose. Eh? They're, they're hedging instruments, but they are also different in a couple of ways. So where they are the same is that they are both Obligations, yeah, both sides of a forward or a future contract have an obligation, so it's a symmetric contract in that regard, and it's an obligation to buy or to sell a given amount of something. Yeah. That amount has to be contract, it has to be part of the contract for a given price, it has to be also part of the contract at a given time or a given date in the future. And the big difference between futures and forwards is that forwards are tailor-made and futures are standardized and, uh, and therefore more liquid. Tailor-made means also that they're not liquid. Futures are liquid. Tailor-made also means that they're expensive and you have to pay the bank that sells you the forward, uh, uh, the bid as spread. And, uh, and that is usually a higher fee than the commission you have to pay for the exchange if you, pay, if you buy uh, futures. The nice thing about a tailor-made hedge is that you can tailor it exactly the way you want it, 
and uh, uh, and that is impossible or at least harder to do with uh, futures. Now, forwards are mostly used for hedging, and futures are designed also for hedging, but they are also used a lot for speculation because you can then speculate on um, on movements of, of something, it could be the currency price, uh, the, the commodity price, stock price, bond price, uh, because there are th these, these, uh, these forwards and futures exist for many things, many assets. Um, and so you can also speculate on these, um, on these price changes. Now this is the payoff diagram for two uh, types of uh, forwards, with futures it works basically the same. So the left diagram is the long forward payoff. So the fat line, the fat blue line is long forward payoff. Uh, so that means that um, uh, if long means that uh, your product, has, so you've bought the future, as you bought the forward, sorry, and if the uh, price of the, um, of the underlying asset goes up, so does the value of the forward. And the, the, the graph on the right is the converse, there it's a short position and that means that you have, uh, that if the, uh, the price of the underlying asset goes up, the value of the forward goes down. And this is all in the future, right? So um, let's say, and why would you use a long forward? Well, you would use it to hedge a short position in a currency, let's say uh, again. You're a European investor, a European company, and you um, uh, and you uh, need to um, you need to pay dollars uh, later on in three months or something. Then this is the kind of instrument that you're going to use because uh, if you need to pay dollars and dollars get more expensive, that is bad for you. Uh, and the way to cover that is by taking this long forward, this long forward, because then. Uh, your obligation uh, in dollars is, ex ex is perfectly offset by the value of the forward, no matter what happens to the, to the dollar. And the other way around um, in the right graph. So what you have to do, be able to do is to understand also uh, the, 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 the combined payoff between your underlying position, uh, that's your currency position that you have, that's the, that's the narrow blue line, and the forward, and that you are, uh, if you combine the two and you add them up, uh, 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 then you see that you're, you're going to be at the horizontal line and there's no price fluctuation in your position. Okay, the other way to go uh, and hedge your currencies is with options. And options are one-sided rights uh, rather than mutual obligations. This is very, very important. So there's a key difference between, on the one hand, options, and on the other hand, forwards and futures. Options are the right to buy and sell a given amount of something for a given price at a given time in the future. So all that is the same. But the, the only difference is that an option is a right, so the op and the option buyer has the right. But if I have a right, then the guy or, or woman I, I buy it from has an obligation, because otherwise the right is, is an empty right. So the option seller has an obligation, and the seller requires a premium for it, which is called the option premium. So the option is an asymmetric instrument. I have the right, and then you have the obligation as the seller. Now, there are options on currency, on commodities, on stocks, on indices, on the interest rates, on, 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 on many things. And there are two varieties, there are over-the-counter options, they're a bit like forwards in the sense that they are tailor-made and more expensive, uh, and, and basically whatever you want, but most options are traded at an exchange. And for exchange-traded options, because they're traded, they have to be standardized. The expiry is once a month, usually, depends of course a bit on the country and the exchange, but usually once a month. The counterparty is the exchange clearinghouse, Delivery is never actually, so if you, if you buy an option on, let's say, oil, then uh, in three months' time, you have, let's say you have a call option on oil, uh, and you have the right to, to buy oil, then um, in after, after three months, if the option expires, they will say, okay, what's the value of oil, so what's the value of this option, and we pay you the money of, 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 uh, that we owe you, and you don't actually have to buy the oil. 
So there's no the settlement is always in cash. And the amounts are also standardized. Now, so this is uh, the payoff diagrams for two for the four main option positions. Uh, on the left uh, above is the uh, is the put option. Okay, so if you're uh, if you have bought a put option uh, and you're you're so you loan the put option um, uh, and you you see that the uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, the, uh, the red line uh, goes below zero. That means that you have to pay this option premium, and the uh, uh, the underlying asset, uh, the value of the underlying asset, is the uh, is the gray line. To the right above, you see the call position, uh, the long call. So if uh, and again, by to buy it, you have to pay a premium, and the payoff of the call. Uh, at maturity is the red line and the gray line is the underlying asset. You can also short a put. If you do that, you get the premium. So that means that you see that the, the red line, the horizontal part of the red line is in fact above zero. So that premium you get if you sell it. But in return, you have to deliver uh, if the price uh, uh, goes down. And uh, the short call, same thing. If you short it, that means you sell it. You get the premium, but if the price uh, goes up, you have to buy, you're obliged to buy, and you have to buy at a higher amount, so that's not good. So you, uh, in order to, to, to get the premium, you have to have a higher risk. So for, for hedging, the, the upper two are probably uh, better. Now, options have not just intrinsic value, so that's the value that they have at maturity, they also have time value. And uh, the further away is the exercise price, uh, the exercise uh, time, so the, 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 the maturity, uh, the higher is the time value. So the total value at any given time is the sum of the intrinsic value and the time value. And you can see in the dotted line that um, that's, that's, the, that's the option value, the total option value, rather long before the expiry date. And then the red line is the option value not so long before the expiry date, and the blue line is the intrinsic value at the expiry date, and there's no more time value. And the time value is because even an option that is out of the money, and that it's that where the underlying price is currently in, in, the, in the situation of a call, so low that uh, if the option would uh, expire today, there would be no value in the option, so that is an option that's out of the money. Even that sort of option, if there's a lot of volatility, could have some value in two or three months' time. If the underlying currency is, is very volatile, then maybe it, the option will get into the money. And, uh, and that, that volatility is the driver of the time value. Now, there's a, uh, there's, so that is the transaction exposure that you, can, um, uh, that you, that you have in currency. You can also you have operating exposure, you can manage that too. But it's far more difficult and it's far less precise than transaction exposure. An, exp an exporter has positive exposure. Eh? Uh, uh, so when your foreign currency goes up and you're an exporter, that you like that because either your competitive position improves or your profitability goes up or a combination of the two. An importer has a negative exposure. You don't like foreign currencies to go up because you are buying stuff in that foreign currency and that means that you either have to pay more for the goods which would reduce your profitability or uh, if you uh, so if you pay more and you can uh, increase therefore also the the prices of your products in your own country that means that your competitive position worsens relative to somebody who does not import and sells the same goods and for multinational it depends on where, where the imports and the exports are, etc. Et now, the exposure of, a of, of, of firm value of shareholder equity uh, to, these, uh, to these currency fluctuations is measured through regression, uh, and the sign and the size of the regression coefficient measure the exposure. And this can also be a, a multiple regression equation in the case of multiple currency exposures, so you can just put more, more currencies in the equation to look at uh, uh, and you get them more regression coefficients uh, 
and you can use that to hedge. But this is always measured with error. So if you have a fully hedged position that you base on that regression coefficient, then you have a large risk of overhedging. So you look at the hedge coefficient and then you say, well, I'm going to hedge half of that or, or whatever, because overhedging means higher cost and also higher risk. Now, lastly, we can talk about operation exposure that you can manage through operations. And that's less flexible than the financial market hedges, but probably a wise thing to do for, you, for, for a multinational corporation. So you can think about a plant location, put, put plants in places where real costs are low, lowest, also real cost after currency effects. You can do product sourcing where you have a diversified supply chain, which allows you to switch to production to lower cost places. So for example, if you have uh, production in a country where the, uh, uh, where the uh, currency is very expensive all of a sudden, then you can put product production out of that country and into a country where it's cheaper. You can select your market or promote, in, especially in markets where uh, currencies are appreciating and where they are expensive because that's good for your uh, market position and profitability. And lastly, you can borrow where your markets are and match your currency's interest rate payments to the income you get uh, in the same markets. Okay, so that's it for the finance part. These are the most important parts of the, uh, of the course. Um, and then, of course, I also have some reading suggestions. The first is a book that I'm currently reading by uh, Johan Norberg. It's called Open. It's really quite amazing. Uh, showing why some countries grow and others do not, and why some countries grow at certain times and others do not. It's a very uh, historic and fantastic book. The other advice that I have for you is to read what other people around you do not read. And so it's very tempting to read the same uh, Wall Street journals or Financial Times or whatever newspaper that your friends read too and your colleagues read too, but that's not so useful. In the end, you have to think about what do you bring to the table. And your, uh, your use uh, as a colleague is, um, is driven by uh, fresh, by a fresh look. And you get a fresh look by reading other stuff. So if all your colleagues read the Financial Times, that is a reason for you not to read it and to spend your time on something else. So you bring a fresh look to the table and it makes you more productive and uh, more useful to your organization. Okay, with that, I stop. Uh, thank you very much, and I hope you do really well on...